think that you're going to like this. I bought this as a gift for some family members that Laura is going to visit later this month. And I bought it from an artist that is based in London that makes these beautifully enlarged postage stamps as wall art. Now, I think this is a really neat gift for either the stamp collector or from a stamp collector, especially if the friend or family member knows that you collect stamps. An elegant design that just pops in its frame. I believe it comes in three different sizes and this is actually the smallest. Now, I learned about this artist through Instagram and his name is Guy G. It appears that he has a design for most countries represented in his collection, of which all are digitally reimagined as he has touched them up added or changed the colors, and ultimately created this beautiful presentation that works really well. I'm also kind of eyeing the China Junk Boat one. That's a favorite of mine I think I might have to get. The family that Laura is visiting has a connection to Colombia, and so I think this is the perfect gift to give them, especially since they know that we are very much involved in the production of these stamp videos. Now, of course, I couldn't just give them a stamp image or stamp art without knowing a bit about the stamp itself. So I went and got one and did a bit of research. This is an airmail stamp first printed in 1921, the early days of aviation, and has a face value of 50 centavos of the Colombian peso. It's actually a private airline company that was issuing these stamps known as SCATA, or Sociedad Colombo Alemana de Transportes Eros, Colombian German Air Transport Corporation. They are considered to be the world's second airline company to exist and the first for Latin America that technically still exists today under the name Avianca. From my understanding, this company had control over all of Colombia's airmail and so they produced their own stamps to prepay airmail fees. This one being a beautiful design that came in several different face values and depicts a Scatta Junker plane flying along the Magdalena River Valley surrounded by the central and eastern ranges of the Colombian Andes. These Scatta Junkers were German manufactured and some of the first all metal planes out there famous for being converted to seaplanes with floats that made them ideal for landing on rivers such as the Magdalena River in Colombia. You may also find these stamps with letter abbreviations printed over them. These were to encourage foreign airmail to Colombia and they were sold abroad at consular offices. So they were overprinted with one or two letter abbreviations to show which country they were sold in. If you find them with EU printed on them, for example, they were sold in the United States, Los Estados Unidos. These are beautiful stamps in any album and a perfect stamp for some wall art and really a conversation piece for any home. I will leave Gaiji's info in the video description as well as links to his social media so that you can learn more about his work. Now, this isn't a paid promotion or anything, just me highlighting an artist that is leveraging the beauty that Philately has to offer and is doing so in an elegant and neat way. I think there are only 75 to 100 of each stamp that he will make. This one is number 23 of 100 and they are made to order, so check it out if you are interested. Now, this is what you'll call a filler episode, more of a check-in to say hi, because I don't really have any more philatelic content to show you. Instead, what I intend on doing is showing you how I make these videos, uh, the process, the tech I use, all my secrets and more. So if that interests you, sit back and enjoy this filler episode of Hashtag Philately. I'm behind in video production at the moment because, well, I've been busy. Uh, a few weeks back we had virtual stamp picks, which I thoroughly enjoyed. There was this round table concept which got a lot of attention and generated some great conversation. Uh, also, I've been busy building the Clash of Empires YouTube channel. This is the exhibition taking place at the Royal Philatelic Society in July. So definitely please go over and check out the YouTube channel that I've been working on and consider coming to the event if you're in London during that time. 
Also, I've been researching and exploring some philatelic topics. They've taken quite a bit longer than topics that I have explored in the past. Uh, a few items that I need for filming are stuck in the mail, and I just haven't gotten around to writing any scripts. I know, it, excuses. But anyway, going back to the virtual stamp picks, uh, there was a roundtable discussion hosted by Richard Philatelist in which he shared his processes and approach for creating online philatelic content. This is really great because there is an appetite for online philatelic content out there and there is not enough content being produced. If you go to the Digital Philatelist YouTube listing, you'll see over a hundred YouTube channels that produce content for all of us and they vary in style, but we actually need more. We are playing catch up to all other hobbies and interests out there that have tons of content, massive communities with wonderful collaboration and promotion of their niches. There is a lot more room for online philatelic content creators out there. And I'm not just talking about YouTube, but social media in general. Several social media platforms are largely untouched by stamp collectors. So I thought I would quickly share my approach for how I create these videos. And it certainly isn't the only approach or the correct approach for creating content, but it's the way in which I do it that matches my style. That's talking to a camera, filming on a desk, animating, editing, it's been evolving over the last 130 videos or so, and maybe you'll find it interesting. The majority of my videos today follow a 10 step process. Each of these steps can be time consuming, some more fun than others, but all necessary for me to be happy with the content that I launch. For the sake of this episode, I will not be talking about the research and script writing processes. These I have discussed in other episodes and in interviews. Let's talk about the production stuff, filming and editing. And my least favorite part of them all is filming the dialogue, the discussion I have with the camera. Basically, I'll have that script that I've been working on for the last few days, either printed on, on my desk or on my one monitor that I can flip around and view while I'm filming. I will then memorize the paragraphs that I have to recite. I don't read when I'm talking to the camera. I look directly at the lens having memorized the paragraph. It looks more authentic and you don't get distracted by my eyes going left to right. We're having a conversation. But when I'm showing items on the desk or to prove a point here, I uh, show you my script. I'm actually reading it and not memorizing it. So it's a combination of reading and memorizing. The key to this is to work through my script ahead of time and identify the parts that are going to have items on the table and I'll be talking off camera or when I'm talking directly to the camera and I'll need to memorize it. Note that there's a lot less scripting when it comes to event based videos where I'm at STEM shows for example or mail day episodes where there's more free talking but there's still a lot of preparation that needs to take place prior to rolling the camera. Memorizing and speaking directly to the camera without ums and ahs can make a big difference to the quality of my videos so I take it very seriously and can spend one to three full days filming these episodes and wearing the same shirt throughout it. This is a day two of me filming this particular episode. Now I'm very grateful that I will live in a time Time of gigabytes and not physical film because I cannot possibly waste so much physical film making these episodes. I'm not a professional. I capture hours of video during this first phase of the process. Lighting is also extremely important and I'm not very good at utilizing it. Um, I have a very small room so I can't set up artificial lighting. I share this room with my office and a few other things. So I use primarily natural light. I have experimented with working at night with some artificial light at the end of the day, I use natural light and natural light is limited by the hours of the day and the seasons. So I have the luxury of more film time during the day in the summer and less film time during the winter. During the winter, I'm more likely to take three days to film this dialogue piece. Oh, and one last thing, sound, it's really important. You won't realize just how noisy your neighborhood is until you start filming at home. It's pretty noisy. There is a lot more. Now, a key aspect that you may have already realized about my approach to filming is that I'm not capturing anything on the desk during this part of the process. There's no overhead camera capturing any movement of my tongs with stamps and covers. In fact, half the time, I don't even have the stamps and covers applicable on the table. I'm pretending to do that action of moving my tongs around. 
All of that filming will come later. The goal of this part of the process is to capture the dialogue. And so I will sometimes not even have the covers or stamps in my possession because they're still in the mail making their way here. At least this way I can get the key part of the dialogue done and start editing it before needing it for the filming on desk portion of the process. Now this camera that I use for this part of the process is a digital single lens reflex, a DSLR. Um, it's nothing special, it does an okay job. It's a Canon Rebel T6i. Um, the autofocus can get annoying, but I tend to move a lot on camera, so uh, I, I need it. But the other critical component is the audio, and I actually place my microphone uh, among a bed of pillows to prevent an echo or any uh, audio bouncing off of my desk and window. Uh, but a directional shotgun mic from Rode is the microphone that works best for me. It is directional, so it captures audio directly from where it is pointing to, which I'm having point to my mouth. Super helpful when you're at a noisy place like a stamp show. If you're filming at a stamp show, good idea to get a shotgun mic to help you film as you go. It's directional, like I said, it can plug into your iPhone, you point it at the subject that's talking and you'll get better audio than that scattered sound that comes from around the room that dilutes the speaker's voice. You can actually spend as much or as little as you want when it comes to film equipment. A smartphone camera actually does an outstanding job and I use it when filming events like stamp shows. I actually taped and bolted together a couple camera mounts so that I can put my smartphone um, on the camera mount and hold it with two hands when I'm at an event with a third point that can touch my shoulder and keep it stable. And then you're not gonna hear me now, but I then put my microphone on top and I can add a battery pack uh, to it as well. And this does exactly what I needed to when I'm filming at events. Now, let's see if I can fix that so you can hear me again. Um, but yeah, this cost me little to nothing and it's easy to store much better than carrying around a DSLR camera uh, to events. I don't have to carry any additional batteries or wires uh, because I'm just using my phone. Now, Laura, on the other hand, she gets all fancy and uses a gimbal from DJI, the same company that I get my drones uh, from. But this is quite a complicated thing, at least for me, to master and walk around while talking to people. Of course, using the little joystick to uh, control the direction it points, to move it carefully and so on. So yeah, this isn't for everyone. Laura loves it. I, on the other hand, prefer a couple mounts bolted together to form this little rig. So this is costing almost nothing and this costs quite a bit. I've used some very basic cameras in the past, a couple camcorders which I can't find, um, but ultimately I'm working with this DSLR and sometimes I'll prefer to use the iPhone. I think that's everything that I need to discuss about this first part, which is the longest, it's the hardest, and it's the most painful part of the whole process for me. So let's go to the editor. Okay, can you see my computer screen? I think that's good enough. All right, so after that first part, after filming the dialogue, I'll then upload all of that footage into this video editor application and add it to my video timeline. This is where I'll be cutting out my mistakes, cleaning the audio, and placing markers for where I need to insert the overhead footage that I'm yet to film. This is also where I play with the pacing of the video flow and look for music to purchase that will help break up my talking and provide the right energy or vibe to keep the viewer engaged. For software, I use Final Cut Pro, which is Apple-based and you would need to purchase. If you have a Windows operating system, the leading application there, one of them, is Adobe Premiere, uh, but you do not at all have to purchase software. There are several free editors out there. When I first started, I was using something called VideoPad by NCH, which was a really good starting point for me. Some of your computers will come with free software like iMovie, Windows ClipChamp. Also check out DaVinci Resolve, OpenShot, Shotcut, CapCut. There are a lot of options out there. Maybe I'll put a link or two in the description to help you look around. There is a pretty significant learning curve when it comes to video editing software, at least that's my experience. You have to be patient at first because it can be frustrating, but after a short while, 
you can become a pro. I will say this however, video editing is a super useful skill to have beyond just your hobby. I've used it countless times in my career, uh, as well as with my family, whether it's to share something, teach something, promote something. It is totally a skill worth picking up. Now, this part of the process can take anywhere from two and a half hours to a full day, sometimes longer, depending on the type of video and its length. For example, a mail day episode can have up to a 15 minute runtime, and of course will take a lot longer to edit than an exploring stamps episode, which usually is under 20 minutes. Now, the final product of that first edit is a video with music and big green squares that act as placeholders for the second filming. So let's talk about that now. Back to the desk. Okay, and I think we're back. Great, all right, so this next part is the funnest and probably the easiest for me. This is filming the stuff we've already spoken about. Now, I use three pieces of equipment to do this. Firstly, my iPhone. I think the iPhone camera, for me, it seems to do the best job. It's also the lightest of all my cameras and easiest to maneuver. Um, and then I use a very flexible gorilla pod these are commonly called gorilla pods um, just a little tripod that you can bend and move around to change the angle in which you're placing your phone and i actually just placed my phone on this i forgot the little contraption piece oh i've got it on here okay so if i took this little item here and place it on my gorilla pod we go i can then just place my phone right inside there and position it just as I need to capture stamp or cover. And I can move it anywhere around the desk. I'm not limited to a fixed position or anything along those lines. So that's that piece and that's for anything that's very close. So viewing one stamp or one cover. To view the larger items when I need more desk space, I use something, I use this thing, which I built out of PVC piping. I think it was 1 8 inch. PVC piping and a boat load of electric tape. Now you can actually buy a number of different gadgets and gizmos that mount a camera above your head or uh, on the ceiling or something like that. But I decided to just make mine very inexpensive. This must have cost me $17 in total with all the electric tape, PVC piping, and then just using a handsaw to cut them as you see fit. But it allowed me to make a custom rig that fits my table and allows me to move the uh, iPhone, my iPhone, along it anywhere so that I can film. It's perfect. I needed it at a certain height, one that allows the shadows to not clip the desk and also so that the legs don't take a lot of space as they're sitting on the desk. I put a lot of thought to this, but it was a lot of fun to make one of these. You can do a lot with PVC piping, especially when it comes to cinematography um, and setting up your cameras and so on. So I just have it in three parts that I put together, which is another nice thing about this is that it is um, very easy to store. Come on, there we go. So I've got the legs on and I need to move this out of the way. That's the key trick. And now, <laughs> I've never done this with the camera before, but and now you can see everything. I just put my camera right on there. It balances quite nicely. And uh, let's put it a little more over here. If I wanted to get a shot down here on the table and my camera is sitting right there and it can capture the table quite nicely. Now, of course, I use this shot when I have larger items that this doesn't exactly cover or I just need to cover more desk. And that's especially true when it comes to mail day episodes, when there's a lot of mail on my desk or when I have albums and I'm opening and paging through albums. That's where this particular shot comes in handy. It's a pretty neat little contraption and I'm kind of proud that I made it um, out of PVC piping and electric tape. Although I didn't need to do so much electric tape. I just got carried away. I just had to use it for the joins, but I wanted to make it cool. Now a key filming practice to all of this is matching the motion of the dialogue that I have already filmed. Then when bringing it back to the editor, I would line it up as best I can so as to not distract the viewer's attention with any inconsistencies. You can very quickly take someone's mind off the topic or the talking points that you're conveying in the video with small inconsistencies that catch their attention. 
Now, that's why I take it so seriously. The less that the viewer is aware of the filming process, the better the experience is for them. Now, as I've already touched on, the next phase is editing the desk and overhead shots onto the first edit with the dialogue. At any part of this two editing process, I may identify mistakes in things that I have said or just not like the way it actually came out. So I keep the camera and mic ready to refilm and fix those mistakes. This is also where I film any quick green screen moments or funny gimmicky things that need to take place outside of my studio. And once that is complete, I then move over to creating any animations or special effects required. Final Cut Pro allows me to make most of my animations using keyframes along with special effects. There are also other software applications that I use, but rarely. A key software application I use, and this is surprising to a lot of people, is PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint. And maybe it's because I use it a lot in my job. I use PowerPoint to make postmarks and cancellations and to touch up stamps and covers. In particular, removing the background. If I use a picture of a stamp, say I took the picture on my desk, I will use a dark solid background, throw the picture into PowerPoint, then remove the background and save it as a PNG image file. This makes the item pop on screen and is just a cleaner presentation. If there's any one piece of advice, one key learning that I've had that I can provide to any aspiring philatelic content creator is that you immediately enhance the experience and the enjoyment of the video by making sure that the viewer has the best possible look at the item that you're talking and learning about. I like to make it possible for the viewer to pause the video and examine the item for themselves if they want. The detail should be there for them to get everything you're talking about and more. Notice that when I film other people talking about cups and stamps, the presentation of items is often displayed separately and much bigger than the presenter that is talking. While they are of course important and provide body language that enhances the subject in the story, the item itself needs to be center stage at times and the viewers really do appreciate it. Now, once I've completed that second round of editing, I have a video and I upload that to YouTube as an unlisted video and share it with people to review. And that of course includes Laura and my family and any friends that have time. And I expect them to be brutally honest. This is where they can point out things that they don't like, uh, things that sound weird, uh, things that they don't understand. Anything that I can go ahead and fix, I will go do so. And that fixing often involves refilming or sometimes just cutting pieces out altogether. Okay, let me pause it here for a second because I just went through review and Laura found something that she wanted me to fix. And now that she's pointed it out, it's all I see. So for 70 seconds, there is this rogue hair strand that is just sticking out of my head and it completely distracted her. And now that she's pointed it out, that's all I see. And this is clearly something that I need to fix up. Now I could go and refilm it, but instead what I did was start to give myself a haircut in the software. So frame by frame, I cut this piece of hair off, which has taken me probably about two and a half hours. So maybe looking back, I should have refilmed it, but it's done now. At least I think I got rid of most of it. Hopefully you guys didn't notice. But Laura was right, that was a little distracting. That along with a few other little things that got identified in the review were fixed. So hopefully that helps the video out just a little bit. Now, back to the video. Once I'm satisfied, I make a thumbnail using PowerPoint and Final Cut Pro, upload to YouTube again, and build out the description, titles, and links. I then often advertise on social media before and after launching the episode. Of course, another key part that I take very seriously is the post launch efforts and making sure that I monitor the comments, I respond to as many as I can and interact with the community that I'm very grateful for actually participating and watching my videos. So that's it. That's my process for making videos. I know it sounds cumbersome and time consuming and that's because it really is, but that's what works best for me. Now I've gone to some crazy extremes to complete a video or get particular shots. Most memorable, building a Zeppelin in my parents' home or flying out to the Caribbean so that I can walk out of water after being teleported through a stamp or travel to three different Statues of Liberty or launch my stamp box with a parachute. I've had fun doing all of these things and it adds to the view experience and works with my chosen style. 
Like I said, you do not have to follow any of these processes that I've created. This is something that I've come up with. You can absolutely film without showing your face. You can have stamps animated on a screen uh, with a voiceover. You could do a number of different styles to achieve quality content that viewers enjoy. You certainly don't need any expensive camera equipment or video editing software or any experience. You can create stamp videos on any budget with any skill set. And that's what I want to encourage. If you're interested in starting a philatelic YouTube channel, for example, just get started. My first few videos, I really didn't know how to use the video editing software or a camera, and that all improved over time as I created more and more content. It'll improve for you, especially as your style continues to evolve and become your own unique brand. So I highly encourage you to just get started. Feel free to ask me questions in the comments. I'm happy to answer them. I hope that you enjoyed this behind the scenes look at my filming process. I hope to have a stamp video for you soon, but you know, it does take a little while to produce them. As always, thank you for watching and happy exploring.